So my friend showed me this painting recently. As you can see in the painting, the buildings and constructions are taking over all these mountains. It's as if the building is an evil force that's hurting good nature. But why? Why does a building have to be something harmful or evil to nature? I grew up in a city called Changwon in southern part of South Korea. It's a beautiful city surrounded by endless mountains and very rich in landscape. When I was young, it was relatively a small city. I left Korea in 10th grade. And every time I go back to the city, I get surprised at how much development has taken place. For the most part, it's great. More facilities, which means more comfort and convenience. However, it aches my heart to see something like this, where harsh and rigid buildings are taking over all these mountains, like that painting we saw earlier. But this similar image can be seen in many different cities around the world, like this image of Seoul in New York. It's because so many cities around the world are plagued with a common problem, repeated buildings competing for density and efficiency. Don't get me wrong, these are all very important things, density, efficiency, economical. But if these are the only things you go after when designing a building, buildings become mass-produced products. Look at these two images. Don't they look pretty similar? And funny thing is, many of us already live in one of these. So what does that mean for us humans living in it? I think it means disconnect from nature, disconnect from urban context, and furthermore, disconnect from humans. I see so many buildings around the world that divide between people and space and between nature and built environment. I believe today's world can use better architects and designers, not necessarily for building designs, but more for human interactions and sustainable design. When I look back at my youth, my fond memories are deeply connected with nature. I used to go picnic in one of these parks with my family. I used to go hiking with my dad to all these mountains. So for me personally, seeing all these harsh and rigid buildings taking over all these beautiful mountains, it aches my heart. But more importantly, for others and future generations to come, I hope they get to enjoy nature the way I did, instead of having to live in one of these. So coming out of Georgia Tech in 2007, I was looking for my first job as an architect. I wanted to do something different and unique. I didn't want to do another cookie cutter matchbox. I thought to myself, what would be the most adventurous thing I could do? Well, why don't I move to the other side of the world where I don't know the language or anybody? I moved to China. I found this firm called MAD, and it was just the perfectly named office for my situation because all my friends back in Atlanta thought I was mad for making this move. <laughs> At first, I thought I just liked the look of design they do. But soon I was more intrigued by the philosophy they hold, shan shui. Shan shui literally translates to mountain and water, the elements that evoke emotion, feeling, and movement. Shan shui city is our interpretation from Eastern affinity for nature. It's our vision to balance between humanity, city, and environment through a form of architecture. And it is a vision to create a future city based in spiritual and emotional needs of residents. Look at this old Eastern painting and traditional homes in Korea. When I look at images like this, I feel that nature, built environment, and even humans sort of coexist with respect to each other. And this is reflected in the way we work at Met Office in how we approach projects. There are so many beautiful places in China, one of them being this Huangshan Mountain. Klein came to us asking us to design two higher rise towers in this beautiful nature. 
Is this really what we want to do to this beautiful nature? Is this how we really want to enjoy and appreciate the beautiful landscape? We thought not. So what did we do? We convinced the client to build 10 buildings instead. We traced the contour of existing mountain and erected buildings out of it. So the buildings become part of landscape. It blends into nature. It does not compete with nature. And even humans become part of it, bridging humanity and nature through a form of architecture. There's another beautiful city in the north part of China. It's a city of snow and ice, as you can see in this image, called Harbin. We were asked to design an opera house next to a river and wetland park. Again, we wanted to celebrate this beautiful landscape. I certainly don't believe you want to see another matchbox in this magical landscape. Instead, building can be seamless, not just in terms of architectural form to organic nature, but also in humans' experience. This little slot or this little path along the facade, it's actually a walking path that takes you from the ground all the way to the top where the viewing platform is. So even there isn't any show at the place, you can still come and enjoy architecture as well as view and nature around it. And connection with nature seamlessly continues into this warm and organic interior space. Now, organically shaped building in a very natural setting, that sounds relatively easy to connect nature and architecture. So how about high-density urban settings? There is a city called Nanjing in China, and we were asked to design six city blocks with a program of residential hotel, office, and commercial. And instead of copying these matchboxes around the site, we created a new and unique cityscape. We focused high densities along urban streets and opened up the center of the project for more human interactions and landscape integration. Now, let's move out of China. And quite literally, I moved to Paris for this project. It's a residential project next to a Parc Clichy Batignol. And curvilinear form of this architecture resembles organic elements of nature. But this building is more than just organic form. Can you tell what's missing in this building? It does not have mechanic AC. So even on the hottest day of summer, you won't have AC blowing on your face. So we work with sustainable consultants to carefully articulate every single one of these curvilinear slabs to maximize daylight while minimizing heat gain. We also intentionally located operable windows to maximize the natural ventilation in every single living unit. So the building itself is organic, but actual experience and living quality also becomes sustainable. Now, how about the city of Los Angeles? And again, this is when I literally moved to Los Angeles to establish Matt's first US office, as well as to work on Matt's first US project. The site is two blocks west of La Cienega in Beverly Hills. And this is the building that might have gotten built in this location. Client came to us asking us to redesign the site, keeping the exact same height limit and square footage and all the building regulations as this building. So we designed this. This is our interpretation of homes in Beverly Hills, tall hedges with pitched roof picking out. The building itself becomes art for anybody to enjoy. I believe this is now the biggest living wall in North America. Every time I go to the site, I see people pausing on the street, staring at this building. Landscape is integrated into your daily life. 
And this building so integrated with landscape and so sustainable. The other day, I spotted a raccoon even living in it. Now, many of us, you might already know this project. It's Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Its site is what used to be a parking lot next to Expo Museum Park. We lifted up the building to create a unique and soft skyline, but more importantly, to extend park at the street level. On top of that, we added more landscape on top of the building. So we're bridging nature, humanity, architecture, and even Star Wars. Hopefully, some of these examples of how we, as a group of architects and designers, approach projects provided you with some ideas to bridge nature and built environment, and furthermore, nature and humans. I believe buildings don't have to be mere functional machine for a living. They don't have to be repeated. They don't have to be soulless. They can be more than that. They can become a space that promote humans' well-being physically as well as emotionally and spiritually. They can maximize beauty while minimizing their cost on the planet. They can honor and celebrate what's already there. And that is why I'm committed to connect humanity and nature through a form of architecture. When I decided that I wanted to become an architect, I asked my parents if they were okay with me not being a doctor or lawyer, like as many Asian ex parents would expect. And my mom being such a loving and caring person she is, and my dad, passionate environmentalist, they said to me, if you become an architect, you get to build to help others and, and earth. And wouldn't that be amazing? And that is how I began my journey as an architect. Now, I would like to ask all of you, wherever you're at and whatever you do for a living, how can your journey provide something better for nature and built environment? If we're gonna be spending all this time and resource on this earth to leave a footprint in any way we do, I invite you to provide something better for nature and built environment. I believe we can build our cities to be better, better for nature and future. Thank you.